Welcome everyone to this webinar on instrumentation for N2O control. Uh, this webinar is part of a series of three webinars that we are organizing about measurement, control, and mitigation for N2O emissions. Uh, this webinar is hosted under the umbrella of the IWA and have been organized by the Instrumentation, Control, and Automation Specialist Group. Uh, next slide, please. So before we start some housekeeping rules, so this webinar will be recorded and may available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform and IWA Network website, the presentation slides and other information. The speakers are responsible for securing copyright permission for any work that they will present or which they are not the legal copyright holder. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other material are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the IWA opinion. And next slide, please. So you have two ways to communicate with the panelists. We have the chat box. You can use it for general requests and for interactive activities. And we have the Q&A box that you can use to send uh, direct questions to the, to the panelists. And we will answer those uh, questions in the Q&A session. Next slide. So before we dive into, into the topic, I wanted to introduce shortly the uh, specialist group on instrumentation control automation. So my name is Janel Ferres. I am the current chair of, of the group. Uh, next slide. And uh, the goals of our group uh, can be summarized in three main pillars. So we are an international discussion forum to collect exchange methodologies, different exper experience and expertises, and different aspects of instrumentation, control, and automation for different water systems. So it's about sharing knowledge. We also want to move forward and spread experience uh, to support and promote the use of ICA, but also innovative solutions. So this about disseminations. And we also take into account technical, but also socioeconomical and sustainability aspect of implementation of ICA. Uh, so this is towards the applications in practice. Next slide. So we carry out several activities. So we try to be active in the IWA Connect and uh, different uh, social media channels where we try to share information relevant for the community. We have our group newsletter where we summarize our main activities several times per year. Um, we organize and support different conference, workshops, and webinars like this one. We also support task groups, working groups, and clusters. We are always encouraging publication of ICA-related topics in papers and conference and scientific journals. And we also deliver partnerships and relationships with other uh, organizations that work in similar missions, like, for example, the Smart Water Network Forum. Next slide, please. We are uh, a group that is open to all IWA members, and we have a management committee that is composed by the chair, the vice chair, and until 10 members, each of us fulfilling a specific role. In our newsletter, we'll try to summarize our main activities, like, for example, new projects, activities, upcoming events, uh, PhD thesis that we want to have live, and news from, from the IWA headquarters. So you can always join us and connect to us through our, our, our channels, the IWA Connect Plus and the link in the page uh, to stay tuned and follow all the activities of the group. Next slide. And last, uh, our upcoming events, we have the next uh, instrumentation control and automation conference uh, to be held in Oslo, Norway next year. Uh, the exact date will be uh, published in the next two weeks. So stay tuned for that. And we have also other webinars on the pipeline, like the continuation series of this N2O measurement control and mitigation. We have also another one on um, nutrient removal control. Another one to come about meta collection, that is the output of the meta quotas group. And another uh, webinar about holistic and interoperable systems. This to last to be organized with the MIA specialist group. This about modeling. So stay tuned for that. This I finalize my introduction and give over to, to Oscar and for everyone. Thank you for joining and enjoy the, the webinar. Thank you, Yanelsi. So uh, I will just uh, make a short introduction of our speakers. So uh, I'm also part of the ICA uh, committee. So next slide, please. Okay, so we have uh, five presenters today on this webinar. Uh, and first out will be Yu Yi, and she's, she's a former 
member of the ICA committee as well, and she has been co-editing the, uh, the recent technical report on quantification and modeling of greenhouse gases. And she's a professor at the University of Queensland. So she would give uh, just a short introduction and motivation for why we should consider this N2 control topic. So please Liu, go ahead. Thanks, Oscar, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I will give a very short overview about why we need to measure nitrous oxide. Um, so next slide. Okay, um, we all know nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas and uh, many treatment plants, if your scope two emissions or electricity grid become more and more uh, renew or um, green. So you will be dominant with process emissions. And with the process emissions, nitrous oxide normally will uh, uptake to up to 90% of the carbon footprint. And also the emissions are very highly dynamic, spatial, diurnal, long-term emissions. So um, this is a recent published paper by Princeton University Group. They have uh, reviewed and summarized um, the uh, reported full-scale and pilot-scale data, and then uh, reviewed about the emission factors currently being suggested by IPCC. So um, what they suggest that um, it's definitely with a fixed emission factor, we oversimplified and made misestimation of N2 emissions from the whole sector. So the question is, um, how do we going to improve? So if you want to improve the whole sectors, and also we want the ultimate aim is not just to have the, the, the sector reported as emission, but also to reduce the emissions that we're generating. So we need to have a much better understanding providing the guidelines, uh, mitigation guidelines for uh, majority of the plants or the, the countries who cannot afford even with, me with measuring. So starting with measuring, if you can, and basically um, at the facility level, measuring is the first step that give you also the understanding uh, where your N2 is generated and how that aligns with the operation uh, parameters with your control. Um, then the next is once you identify the, the trans correlations that provide the opportunity for you to reduce the emission. Then with individual facilities or treatment plants uh, come through the process, we can collect more and more data and generate uh, guidelines for people uh, also as a mitigation guideline, then to facilitate the whole sectors uh, to be able to reduce the mission. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, I'm teaching process control at UQ. So um, normally I use that slide to, to tell the students, um, if you want to control something like process optimization, normally the first step is you have to measure it. So without measuring, basically you cannot control. So Lord Kevin is a, um, uh, you, uh, I think British scientist. And then this was also quoted as, um, uh, if you can't measure it, then it's not science. But I would say if you can't, um, if you cannot uh, measure it, you basically cannot control your process. Okay, that's all for my introduction. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations about more detailed tips about how to measure and tool. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Hugh. So next up is Christian, and he's uh, he's employed at IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, and has he has been measuring a lot of these N2 emissions, both with hoods of gas in the liquid phase, uh, mostly on, on different Swedish plants and on a full scale. So we're happy to have some uh, hear some experience from Christian about uh, full scale measurements. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Oscar. Yeah, I've been working with uh, measurements the last 15 years, and uh, I would say it's impossible to wrap it up in 10 minutes how to measure N2O, but I will anyhow try. And I will start with some take home matrices, uh, as that's maybe the most important uh, for my slides. Uh, and I will start with that. it's not the formation of N2O that is the main important aspect, it's what is emitted uh, that we want to measure. And that's quite uh, important to remember. Uh, as you already heard, uh, the measurements are uh, very important as their foundation for all the different work we are doing, whether NTO mitigation or uh, understanding what is happening and so on. And they are possible today. Uh, I will present that a bit. However, it's still the you need to understand uh, the limitations of the N2O measurement uh, in order not to get it wrong. Uh, the N2O measurements are still 
resource intensive, uh, unfortunately. And uh, uh, even though there have been improvements, that's also important to uh, remember. And uh, the final one, it's important to uh, remember that it's not enough just to measure the N2O concentrations. There are different techniques uh, to measure N2O uh, concentrations in the gas or the water phase. Uh, here, the most common listed. Uh, and uh, for example, we using uh, all of these different types uh, in different instruments. There are, of course, different suppliers uh, you're available. Still important uh, to know that it's still a high investment if you want to measure uh, N2O. So it's really good if you have an approach where you can utilize the instruments in a good way. And the image uh, up to the right here, you can see, for example, one of our instruments that we are quick with a multiple channel uh, analyzing uh, feature so that you can uh, analyze six different sample points simultaneously as the instrument has a quite fast response time. And that, of course, then makes uh, measurements more cost efficient. And also you can see here the water sensor that we are, for example, using in combination with the gas sensors. You have to consider uh, pre sample pretreatment for different uh, uh, measurements, uh, the maintenance of the instruments, of course, calibration, the most important one, but also you have to change the electrodes or so for the water sensor, for example. Uh, important also uh, when you invest in the uh, instrument that the measuring interval, sensitivity, interference with other gases, and so on are important aspects. Nowadays, most of the uh, analytical instruments can adjust for these uh, automatically. And that's of course a big difference uh, compared to like 10 years ago where everything had to be done manually. But still it's important to be aware of these limitations or uh, different uh, aspects uh, when you measure the N2O concentrations. Now, if we look at measurements of uh, N2O in the water phase, then uh, I would say that the water, a water sensor is only enough if you measure, for example, in the effluent of a wastewater treatment plant, you have the water flow and then the uh, N2O concentration. So you can uh, quantify the emission to the receiving water, which eventually can be assumed to be uh, released to the atmosphere. Otherwise, the water sensors are good to measure the formation, but also the consumption of N2O in uh, different processes in the wastewater treatment plant. And by that, you can uh, ultimately also control uh, this process. So if you have the uh, uh, formation and consumption in balance, you also have less emissions there. The measurements in the water phase are unfortunately not necessarily easier or cheaper. Uh, it's quite a lot of uh, uh, high investment and also a lot of uh, maintenance work. And also if you use the water sensor and you want to quantify the actual emissions with a uh, mass transfer, then our experience is that you need to adjust the water sensor at the mass transfer model with help of off-gas measurements uh, initially. You see here two examples, one in the upper right corner, the Swedish treatment plant where you see the predicted emission based on the water sensor compared to the actual uh, observed emissions and you see quite a good fit and uh, also the image in the middle here shows an example where one water sensor could control the emissions for a rural process, which we then also could uh, mitigate these uh, emissions from this process. So if you apply the water sensor in the right way and adjust uh, the sensor and the uh, mass transfer model, then you can uh, use these sensors quite efficiently. If it comes to the measurement in the process air, then you can either, if you have a covered process, it's quite easy, you can measure in the uh, ventilation from this process, or like we in Sweden, we have many treatment plants uh, inside the bedrock, where you also can just measure, for example, in the uh, ventilation shaft from this uh, wastewater treatment plant. If not, then you have to use uh, flux chambers, which you can place on the, the surface area of the different basins. You see here image in the upper right corner where we, for example, have four different uh, flux chambers based uh, on the same uh, process. However, there are some challenges uh, you have to, in order to quantify the emissions, you have, of course, to measure the airflow. You can do it over the uh, flux chamber, but as the flux chamber only covers a certain, a really small area of your process uh, area, it's quite difficult to upscale uh, the emissions for the wood treatment plant or the process as such. Food stability may also be an issue if you have certain processes. Uh, and also if you operate the, 
the hood in the wrong way or you place it at uh, the wrong side, you can get quite misleading uh, information about the emissions compared to what you might actually have. You also see here a conceptual image of our hood, for example, that's actually more than 10 years old, this figure, but it's still uh, uh, valid, where you have uh, also other sensors uh, equipped to this hood in order to measure even, for example, the uh, N2O in the water phase. So as the emissions are quite resource intensive so far, it's important that if you want to measure resource efficient, you have to apply the measurements at the right place. Uh, if you are aim for overall emission monitoring, there may be only a few spots that you may have to measure. It's mainly then also the N2O or even the methane, of course, the airflow and the load. Here you see an example down here, uh, the main wastewater treatment plant in Stockholm, for example, which is inside the rock. It's enough more or less to measure in the ventilation shaft from the facility and with the water sensor and the effluent, and you can have quite good emission control or monitoring for the plant. However, if you want to have uh, more control and mitigation for uh, the different emissions, you need to measure at several spots, but also there you can uh, limit yourself to certain areas. Like for example, for the off-gas off -gas measurement, you can use pre-aerated zones. You can uh, uh, measure in the zones right after the pre denitrification and the post denitrification In the Stockholm treatment plant, it's an MBR process you have, for example, the membrane tanks, which are highly aerated, where we have a lot of uh, emission of M2O. So you can limit yourself to these hotspots. For the water phase, you would focus on the effluent, as mentioned before, and also then in the, in the pre-denitrification and the post-denitrification, where you have the formation of N2O that can then be stripped out in the after following aerated zones. And also the inflow may actually be an important point, as you have depending on your sewer system, a lot of uh, emissions, mainly methane, but also N2O. So for large wastewater treatment plants, uh, a continuous measurement at these spots is recommended. And we also have that at some treatment plants in Sweden. For smaller treatment plants, it's uh, the strategy we apply in Sweden and recommend as often that we have an initial short screening at the different hotspots uh, based on the evaluation there. Uh, take up a mitigation strategy and then have a follow-up measurements uh, at these hotspots in order to see how the uh, actual mitigation was successfully or not. Uh, the, act, the measurement of N2O uh, is not so easy as it may say here, but still you can measure as I have shown, but there are some uh, uh, aspects that you really have to consider, like when to measure if you have these campaigns, it's quite important. You need to have a representative uh, measurement period the placement of the sample hood is really, really important. Uh, and that is not just uh, so easy. The measurement duration, the sequence, if you can measure different points simultaneously, it's totally different than if you have to measure each point after each other. Then during that time, the load and the conditions can already be changed. You can have some disturbances like the foam you see in the upper image here, which makes it quite difficult to apply a, a hood or in the image you see below where you have the erasion system in one and the same basing is uh, uh, can have a quite different sequence. And then, of course, uh, quantifying the airflow, the process air coming uh, to the hood uh, in order to quantify the total emission can be quite challenging. And often the treatment plants don't have enough information to actually quantify a good airflow uh, for the different uh, process zones. And you have to measure more than just N2O. So it's really important that you have all these different aspects in order to quantify the uh, emissions, but also in order to understand why you have this, uh, the N2O formation and emission. And the resolution and is also an important aspect. If you have a five second resolution of your N2O measurements, but only a weekly composite sample of your uh, nitrogen load, it's understandable that it's quite difficult to use this data. And my last slide, just to see, there is improvement of the measurements all the time. But as I said before, you shouldn't wait. It's already possible to measure today. But there are new technologies on the way. But also, they, they still need a lot of uh, manual work. They are time consuming uh, and expensive. So the goal and what we are working on right now is to really develop uh, enter O probes that can be used like any other probes in a waste water treatment plant uh, that are affordable, flexible, which really would make that the measurements can be uh, done even at smaller treatment plants all the time 
that would then provide us the data that we would need in order to better understand benchmark model and also implement uh, active mitigation work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Christian. So, uh, and, and please uh, text your questions in the Q&A box if you have any during the session. So we will answer them either during time or, or in the end of the webinar. So from a Swedish uh, research institute, uh, Swiss Universe uh, Research Institute. So uh, Wenzel Grubel is at the EVAC since 10 years and uh, uh, he's currently running his uh, startup company uh, since two years uh, where he makes uh, or conducts uh, N2O measurements, uh, hood based ones. And so he will share some experience from that work now. So please go ahead Wenzel. Thank you, Oscar. Um, I will be presenting about the Swiss case. Uh, we've been monitoring N2O emissions from wastewater treatment plants over the last 10 years, and we've been focusing on an off-gas monitoring-based uh, approach only, um, with hoods, of course. Uh, I'll start with the take-home messages. Still was the first. Um, of my presentation. So um, we will see that NTO emissions vary substantially over time in space and between different wastewater treatment plants. Hence, we need, uh, as um, we've seen in the previous presentation, a reliable, robust, and flexible monitoring so solution. Um, and one possible solution, and that's the one I'm going to show, is, uh, is called NOTOS that has been uh, developed by IAVAC, uh, ETH Zurich, and upwater. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with the dynamics we've seen in the past years. Um, first of all, um, I think the probably the most important feature of N2O emissions are the seasonal dynamics. So we see very strong differences over time, and that's why we need to measure N2O over at least one year. Um, this is an example from Switzerland, and we've seen many more like this. Um, the other component is that we see a high variation of emission factors between different plants. Uh, so what you see here is the N2O emission factor as a function of the nitrogen removal of this uh, specific biological treatment. And we see um, there is a high variation between uh, different plants. So between almost zero to 8% of the, of, the tree, of the incoming nitrogen is being emitted as N2O. So we need to measure each plant. There is no easy rule how we can extrapolate the emission factor of a specific plant. Um, uh, the third component I would like to mention is the spatial variation. And this is an example um, nicely shown by our colleagues from ETH Zurich, uh, Daniel Brown and his colleagues. They measured the, the off-gas flow uh, on one lane. Um, and on the left side, you see the off-gas flow um, distributed over the whole lane. And we see um, in, in the figure below that there is uh, quite a substantial variation between uh, the different spots. So we have a high interest to monitor the emissions at each of these different spots because they are likely very different. And then as a validation of this approach, they put all the hoods together and we see um, uh, that the flows then match uh, quite nicely. Um, and the fourth component and, uh, is, um, again, about local airflow, um, which is uh, a very important variable uh, in end to emission monitoring, because we always multiply flow with concentrations. Um, and here we see how you could estimate flow. So either you take the blower speed and then uh, calculate a certain amount of air that is being put into a reactor, or you measure it locally. And in some cases, on the left side, we talk about uh, new diffuser membranes, um, less than a year. Uh, these uh, values match quite nicely. If you talk about older, and I think five years is not really old for diffuser membranes, we see a strong mismatch of uh, these two variables. So actually, by using the blower speed, we dramatically overestimate the actual airflow uh, and then this would lead to a dramatic overestimation of the emissions. So measuring airflow is important as well. Um, 
what is a solution uh, to deal all, to deal with all of these um, components? Um, uh, the thing we came up is called Notos. Uh, it's an uh, end-to-end -end monitoring solution, um, and I will just explain you uh, the important uh, features of this monitoring solution. So first of all, it's online monitoring. We can monitor over years um, uh, or just over one month. Um, uh, uh, in a, uh, in an online mode. So every 45 seconds, we get a new uh, measurement, no matter uh, how, how many sampling points you have. You can measure up to 14 sampling points, so we, we really can tackle uh, the spatial variation on a, on a treatment plant. It's fully automized. This means there is almost no regular maintenance for an operator, which is really nice because then you can easily measure over uh, extended periods of time because uh, it's not very um, time consuming for your operation. And it's been applied. So we've done um, about 20 wastewater treatment plants in Switzerland, and this really works. Um, here you get some insights. So um, how does it work? You have this hood, which is connected to a central monitoring station. This hood is easy to mount. Um, you can install eight to six hoods easily within one, within one day. Um, it, is, uh, it has a low dead volume. This means you have fast air exchange within this hood, and this allows um, um, uh, really robust measurements of, 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 um, of uh, variation over time. And you have a local airflow measurement that has been developed by ETH Zurich on top of this hood. The analyzer, um, which is connected to the hood, could look like this. Um, depending on your uh, needs, it can be stationary or mobile. It can have one channel or multi-channel, depending on your needs. There is a gas pretreatment uh, that uh, robustly removes all the liquids and activated sludge that potentially comes with the off-gas, and calibration is done automatically. So really uh, different from what we know from liquid sensors, it's, uh, it's a um, very low maintenance approach. Um, once you have these measurements, uh, you can start um, doing robust mitigation. Uh, I think from my point of view, this is a very important part of mitigation um, monitoring. Um, in Switzerland, um, we've been using dynamic process control as a mitigation strategy. Um, so we uh, look at the loading of a treatment plant in an automated way and then adapt um, the, the control of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, one thing, one important thing um, we think is um, the, the operation of swing zones, for example, so that you only aerate them uh, when you really need them. And uh, we could show that this leads to substantial reduction of emission factors. Uh, the other part is reject water dosage. Reject water has a very strong impact on on n2o production on waste in wastewater treatment plants um, so only those reject water from sludge treatment when your plant has the capacity to deal with it and then the third um, point is oxygen set points um, you can adapt them depending on the loading of the treatment plant if you have them on a low level all the time you might risk very high emissions um, uh, but you can, uh, depending on the loading, as I said, you can reduce these values. And if you implement this, and this is from a real wastewater treatment plant where we had two years of monitoring. So with their standard control, they had an emission factor of above 0.6%. And once they implemented the dynamic control, they could reduce it by 50%. Um, and this has been shown on multiple wastewater treatment plants. And with this, I come to my conclusions. Um, so uh, I could show that emissions differ between different wastewater treatment plants. They differ over seasons and years, um, or at least over a year, but they can even differ between different years. So measuring as long as you can is make sense. And they differ between lanes uh, because we have this spatial vari variability. Um, uh, and this is why we need a highly a spatially resolved monitoring approach. Um, so this means, in summary, um, uh, N2O monitoring strategies, they should be long-term, so at least one year again, but I think this is super important, spatially resolved, and if you can afford uh, a local airflow measurement, because there can be 
quite some variability. Um, and with this, uh, I'm open for your question over the chat. Ah, sorry, forgot my last slide, probably a very important one. Um, uh, so currently, uh, together with uh, um, Professor Liu Yi and other colleagues, we're coming up with a, with a practical monitoring protocol that you can implement um, the, the, the features, um, uh, the important features for monitoring uh, in your uh, own monitoring approach. And we're going to summarize this as a practical monitoring protocol. Um, and the plan is to um, publish this in 25. So um, uh, quite soon you will have a, a practical guideline to come up with your own monitoring um, uh, solutions. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Lance. Was that your last slide? Great. So uh, next up is uh, Jose Pardo. And uh, as, as both Wenzel and Christian mentioned, it's not only about N2, uh, measuring N2, because you also need to assess the state of the plant in terms of other parameters. So Jose has developed a, a risk-based approach and uh, founded his spin-off company Cobalt Water Global and he's been working on N2O since uh, 2009. So uh, please go ahead Jose and tell us a bit more about this. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so before we go into uh, what and where to measure, I thought it'd be helpful to think about the various control objectives that there might be because there are different levels in which we can act upon insights from measurements. And I guess at a, the highest level, there would be advisory insights provided that would then prompt human-led process control adjustments. So these would be manual adjustments based on what we're seeing. Uh, we would then take appropriate action and adjust the, the current control um, manually and do that periodically based on uh, the most current data. So monitoring using advisory insights and then manually making adjustments. But then we have uh, at a different level uh, instrument signals for real-time control. Uh, and this would be integrating the insights from measurements directly into the current SCADA control, so directly programming logic uh, within the existing uh, SCADA package. But we're also looking at integrating the insights into advanced co process control or digital twin platforms that um, are provided by advanced process control solution providers. And this would be um, looking at slightly more advanced. So looking at multi-criteria multi optimization in, in real time. So those are the types of uh, control objectives that we normally are dealing with in terms of implementing uh, control for reducing N2O. So in terms of where and, and what to measure, so we have lots of different possibilities and starting with I think measuring N2O emissions which is ultimately what is most important uh, we are looking at things like the actual N2O concentrations whether this is in the gas or in the liquid we need to be measuring airflow to be able to calculate what the emissions are uh, we're looking at the area and depth and depending on what type of aeration you have, whether it's diffused aeration or surface aeration, you might have other parameters that you need to take into account to properly calculate what the emissions are and be verifying whether, uh, first of all, what they are, but then whether you're actually reducing them based on the control. Uh, then we have N2O itself. So this is, um, this could be either measuring in the gas. So we, N2O is important, uh, probably the most important, or um, verifying whether we're reducing or not, uh, but this can also be in the liquid. 
And this is from hard sensing. So whether you have a hood or a sensor in the liquid, uh, we're measuring N2O normally uh, where N2O is being produced. So to the right, we see uh, we're looking at aeration tanks. So it's important to be measuring um, so that you can quantify the total N2O emissions. So you want to be measuring the concentrations and everywhere where N2O is being produced. So for example, if we look at here within a lane, uh, it's two zones. So if you're only measuring in, in one zone, you may not be capturing what's happening in the second zone. So that if you're using this N2O concentration to quantify the emissions for this entire lane, uh, you would tend to be either overestimating or underestimating what the total emissions are. So it's important that you are placing sensors so that you're in a position to calculate the total emissions. And in terms of where to put these sensors, obviously you, this combines process knowledge to under your nitrogen conversions are taking place, but also knowledge on N2O dynamics. Uh, so you, you would select what would be the most appropriate based on the knowledge, but then you should always physically verify any spatial variability that you have. Uh, and that can mean moving sensors around and more putting multiple sensors within a zone so that you can verify that the reference location that you initially selected is the correct one. Then we have uh, N2O concentration where we might not be able to, to measure. Uh, so for example, here we are showing hard sensors in red in the aeration tanks and soft sensors in purple. So it's not always feasible to measure in all lanes and all zones. And, and in most cases, it's not. And so what we can do is look at other process parameters so that when we are doing measurements, we can use machine learning to train a model so that we can then predict what the N2O concentrations are based on what the other process parameters are doing. So these are just some typical parameters that can be used for predicting N2O uh, from training a machine learning model. Uh, as Christian mentioned, it's also important to be understanding what else is happening in the process when we're looking at N2O emissions so we can understand why and when uh, N2O is being formed and emitted. Uh, but we also have, which can be helpful for enacting control actions is what Oscar mentioned is our AI risk. So we can do look at risk of N2O due to low DO conditions, due to high DO conditions, pH, and other parameters to help us understand why we're forming N2O and what we can do to avoid that. So to give some examples of the, the different levels of control and using the various measurements to enact control actions. Here we're looking at using the signals for that ad those advisory insights and then manually making adjustments in the process. So in this example, we're looking at a few different things. So we're looking at the risk due to N2O, which is this red. Uh, and here we can see that the, there's these peaks of risk due to high DO conditions. Directly underneath, every time you have these peaks, you have ammonia that's being converted, uh, which makes sense. You have high oxygen. If you have ammonia, there's no reason why you shouldn't be converting this. Uh, but what we also see is in each, in each case, N2O is coming up. As you're converting this ammonia, your N2O is coming up. And this is mainly due to uh, high DO conditions, which would prompt the hydroxylamine oxidation pathway. But we can also look at the DO to see what the DO actually is during these times so that we can make uh, an informed decision on what to adjust the DO to. So we can also look at the recommended DO, uh, which is also provided through our N2O risk DSS platform. So in this case, really just DO and ammonia and, and obviously N2O is what's needed to prompt actions. And this is, I guess you would be doing this in a periodic basis, uh, whether it's every week or every two weeks, you'll be monitoring and then making adjustments manually. So this is one way. It's a bit more work, but 
But here's another example of advisory level uh, control adjustments. And this is actually based on uh, ABAC, so ammonia-based aeration control. And in this case, we saw that they are producing N2O during periods of risk due to low DO conditions, but also during high DO conditions. So if we were looking at their DO, we would see that a lot of the time they were above what would be recommended, and a lot of time they were below what's recommended because the way the ammonia-based aeration control works, you have a low DO set point and a high DO set point. So based on this, we can make informed decisions on adjusting the DO. So that's what they did. They made a manual adjustment and they brought it in line with what was recommended. And then we see uh, an immediate drop in the N2O. And in this particular case, which was in the Netherlands, uh, it resulted in a 90% reduction. So then we have the measurements for advanced process control or digital twin platforms. And, and this is actually fresh from the Large Wastewater Treatment Plant Conference last week, which was um, presented by, by Peer Control, Erica Varga. Um, and here, what we're showing is machine learning because we, if we're look, using a digital twin and uh, model predictive control, we need to have a model to be able to look at different scenarios and then implement the, the best scenario. Um, and what's important here is that the data is always good. Uh, so here we can see which are the parameters or the measurements that we're using for making the N2O predictions. So if these are not good, then your model results are not going to be good. And, and this is the case for any of the digital platforms. We also work with Xylem and Createch 360. And each of those, regardless of exactly how they're using the insights, what's important is that the other measurements are uh, of good quality. Oops, sorry. And then one thing to mention, is so regardless of what we're using for control, whether it's manual adjustments or advanced process uh, control, we need to be monitoring N2L. So as I mentioned before, we can't measure everywhere. So what we can do is train a model based on those measurements and then be able to predict what's happening in the parallel lanes where we're not measuring. And this is a, a case in the UK where they were measuring in parallel lanes. So we were able to test one model uh, in the other lane where there were measurements and we can see that we can get good results. And this is based on long-term measurements. So as you can see, where and what to measure depends on the control applications. Besides N2O, there's lots of other parameters that we need to be measuring. And it's important that these the data quality is of high quality. And it's important to measure into a for monitoring and verifying reductions in any control situation. And we can also see that we models can help get more out of our N2O measurements, either for digital twin applications or for monitoring in parallel lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. So I hope this webinar has given some, some flavor for measuring N2O for the purpose of control. Uh, but there, as, as probably most of you are aware of, there are a lot of other webinars out there providing good insights in N2O from different perspectives. So Amanda here will give us uh, a short uh, uh, information about where you can find more resources and more webinars. And, and text on this uh, important topic. So Amanda is with Jacobs and she's the head of carbon and global uh, carbon and circular economy. Uh, so please go ahead, Amanda. Thanks, Oscar. Yes, in our, in our Water Europe business. Um, but here I'm really representing Iowa and um, we have a great Climate Smart Utilities Greenhouse Gas Monitoring subgroup. Um, I'm going to paste a, a form in the chat here, and um, this group is open to, to anyone um, who wants to be part of it, um, ideally working your way towards an Iowa membership as well. Um, but if we just go to the next slide, please, I'll tell you a little bit about the group and some of the things that we've done. 
So myself, um, Erica and Jürgen are our co co-leads for the group. Um, it sits within the Climate Smart Utilities Initiative and that's really a recognition initiative that IWA started. Um, we have great support from, from Charles and Brenda there that you see on the slide, but um, the IWA Climate Smart Utilities Initiative is really recognising um, climate action by utilities and there's a number of, it's a program, a recognition program and on, on the, um, you'll find a lot of kind of case studies and nice uh, nice evidence there on the Iowa site, but our subgroup is actually more of an active um, an active group, a working group, um, and we, we have a regular call. Um, you can find us on the Iowa Connect Plus page um, as a under the Climate Smart Utilities program. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll just briefly, some of the things that we have done, we've got, there's about 150 members in the, in the Climate Smart Utilities group um, of the Greenhouse Gas Monitoring subgroup, though there's, there's probably a core number of us who um, who join monthly calls where we can and uh, hopefully that next slide's coming up soon. And um, yeah, what we've done, we've established in 2021 and um, we've really worked on um, some publications on a few series of webinars and um, and we've got some ongoing work, which is really nicely aligned with that that Bensel and Liu mentioned. And I think all the speakers that you heard today have either presented on our subgroup or are members of the subgroup as well. Um, but we'd like to develop some utility facing guidance, which would which would um, align nicely with the protocol that, that Liu, Bensel and others are working on. Um, but there's some publications there. There's links that you can find find online. And um, we, we created a poster for the recent Iowa Congress Progress on um, towards tier three, 10 kind of lessons learned for nitrous oxide measurement. And you can you can find that um, in the in the library, uh, the Climate Smart Utilities Library, and a number of webinars and um, which were based upon the book publication from a few years ago that many of you will have um, will have heard of. Um, next slide, please. But if you'd like to find other resources, um, the, two, the two sets of webinars that we have been involved in um, really showcase the, the 2022 publication, uh, which Liu, Jose and Ingmar um, co-edited and a number, many people co-authored, and that was on greenhouse gas emissions from uh, water, uh, urban wastewater facilities. Um, and so we did a webinar there, which gives a nice overview of the book and then a really deep dive into N2O methane and also mitigation. And then last year, we did a series on the Danish progress around um, nitrous oxide and methane. And we've had a lot of knowledge shares. Um, if you've got ideas or if you'd like to join our group, please fill in that um, form that I put in the chat. And that's all I really wanted to say. Thank you very much. And hope to see some of you on one of our monthly calls, as well as on these fantastic webinar series. And well done, Oscar and the team uh, for organizing them. Thanks a lot, Amanda, for sharing. So uh, please, uh, all of the speakers, uh, many thanks to you and, and you can put on your cameras. So uh, I look in the Q&A box here and it's it's been a few questions popping in and, and most of them have been answered by, by the by the presenters. So please, please add more questions. Uh, just to start up this uh, Q&A session, I, I just wonder if, if you would like give an advice to, I guess there are a lot of practitioners looking at this, uh, this session here. Where, where would you recommend them put, to put their effort? So we have seen like there's a lot of different sensors. We've been talking about quality in the data, uh, spatial variability, long-term versus short-term measurements. I'm sure there are opinions on where, what, what is the most important thing to, to focus on in the first, uh, like the first step. So, do you have any opinions on that? Right, shall I start? Yeah, I yeah. Share yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think if you are utility people, you're just uh, new to this topic, um, probably uh, start to uh, first look at how many treatment plants you are managing. Uh, normally, I would suggest you start with uh, the bigger ones or the most common configurations that you are managing, uh, like in your in your in your organization. And then again, measurement is is not uh, is not cheap. So if you do have some now plan to start with monitoring uh, practice, then starting with. Uh, uh, probably the one that you feel most valuable to you. Either larger ones represent uh, a large uh, volume of wastewater you're treating or those configurations that you are using the most. Uh, 
So um, I think that's a starting point. Any other side comments from the other speakers? I guess it was a very wide question, intentionally meant wide. So we, we can continue with the more specific questions in the Q&A set. So we have a question here about measuring N2O from sewers. So what sensors would you like to use for that and, and how would you do that? Underground source. Sorry? So is that the, sorry, is the question about the measuring N2O from the sewer or yeah, the underground I, sewer pipe? So it's... I, under, I, I assume it's an underground sewer system. So I guess it's difficult to fit the hood in the in the sewer pipe. So how would you do it then? Okay, um, first it's very challenging, very cost, <laughs> very costly given the length of sewers you have. Um, for the rising mains, you can just measure dissolved, but I assume it will be very, very uh, little because uh, it's a full field. Um, gravity sewers, um, very difficult as well. You have both gas and liquid, but again, so far, um, it depends on the characteristics of the sewers and also your the sewer pipes. Not all the sewers is a hotspot open tool. Uh, some particular ones may be more likely to generate, but again, uh, most of the N2O so far, because we also measuring dissolved N2O for the influent, um, monitoring the influent, we have seen little, little N2O dissolved uh, coming from sewers. So if you do have the funding support, I would suggest maybe focus on the, uh, the aerated uh, bioreactors uh, first. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christian? Yeah, yeah totally, totally agree there. Uh, so don't spend your money on the sewers if you uh, are limited funds. Uh, we have been doing uh, measurements at the sewers in uh, Sweden as well, but it's really cost intensive and uh, we use it in often pump stations and so on where you can uh, measure a bit easier, but it's really complex and not that easy. So. And it really depends on your sewer sewer system, uh, how much emissions you have. But it's maybe more important for the methane than for the uh, N2O. Thank you. Jose, do you have any side comment there? Yes. So uh, I agree with what, what both Leo and Christian mentioned. Uh, but just to add, if I guess you are having enough funding to, to measure in the sewer, I think, first of all, Methane is is obviously going to be more of a concern, as Christian mentioned. But uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to fit a hood in the sewer, especially if you have a small manhole cover to to fit it through. Depending on the size of the hood, it might fit. Uh, but you don't need the hood because you're already in the gas phase, so you can just put the air tubing in. Um, so I've measured N2O and methane in sewers that way uh, with some success. But you can also use the sensor too, depending on the depth of the sewer, the water level in the sewer, you might be able to put the sensor in there and that should provide just as good measurement as it would in an aeration tank. Um, so I think uh, if really interested in measuring the sewer, that there are uh, some methods that work. Good. Let's see if we can have some presentation next time about the sewer measurements. So I have a question about uh, when you measure N2 in the off gas, how can you avoid interferences? So I guess, yeah, maybe it's an open question. I guess all of you have thought about that. Yeah, go ahead, Benzel. Yeah, sure. So there's one known interference with uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and there the solution is quite simple. You just measure carbon dioxide and then uh, you can uh, um, deal with this issue. And then uh, there are no, I mean, the off gas in, in, from wastewater treatment plants is, is not that complex in terms of other interference. So um, and that's the only one uh, that is actually uh, problematic. Okay. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything to that? Do we consider it closed? Yeah, um, we before, um, so for full scale study, we always also have a sample conditioning unit 
um, before you use analyzer to measure that. So uh, this sample conditioning unit normally will remove a lot of interference uh, that may affect the analyzer to read that signal. So normally when you purchase uh, the gas infrared analyzer, you will have the sample conditioning unit uh, purchased as a set. Great. So Christian, I think you will be the last comment now, yeah? I just wanted to add there, I mean, there has been a lot of progress uh, and uh, uh, instruments the past years. So nowadays the instrument, uh, the sample conditioning and everything is often included automatically. So you don't really have to worry about that, but it's good to know that it was different. As I said, uh, 10 years ago, there was a lot of manual work and instruments weren't available as they are today. So it's much easier today to measure and all. It sounds good development so uh, thank you we will have a few questions that have not been answered so i think we will finish them uh, by writing in the after the webinar i will just ask erin to bring up the slides again and i will let janelsi just finish off this webinar and tell us some some things about upcoming events so before i finish just thanks a lot to the speakers for for providing their uh, experience and knowledge to us here thank you Thank you, Oscar. Uh, once again, thank to all the, the speakers and also to the audience for the for the discussion. So I just wanted to bring a, a short take home message. Uh, next slide, please. So I think it has been quite clear that N2 emissions are a, a real concern for water utilities to our net zero and also mitigation targets. But as our speakers explained it quite well, uh, mitigation is only possible if N2 dynamics are well measured. And measuring N2O is only a part of the picture. Challenges are re still remain, and the broader picture uh, should be considered. And I think we can say that technology is not a bottleneck anymore. Technology is there, but efforts are really required towards unifying best practices for a robust and reliable measurement of N2O emissions in practice. Um, so next slide. So some short information about some upcoming uh, webinars that might be interested to you. We have the Water Climate Discussion, Radical Change, the 3rd of October, and the Digital Water Summit in Bilbao in, in November. So you can look at all the information in the IWA uh, website. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, we are always happy uh, to welcome you in, in, the, in the IWA um, network. Uh, you can always join, you can use the information in the slide to have some interesting discounts as well. As you are a part of the network, you can also join different specialist groups that might be of your interest. And next slide. So uh, with this, we conclude the seminar. I thank you again to all of you, the speakers and the audience for your contributions. And we hope to see you soon and that you have enjoyed the webinar. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>